Can you hear quite easily, or am I echoing? This thing this evening isn't very good, is it? Are you able to hear all right? And can you understand what you hear? Good. I would like now to read to you one verse from the eighth chapter of the Gospel by Matthew and one verse from the ninth chapter. He said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, and be thou clean. She said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Now we have been thinking of transformed thoughts and cleansed speech. Now we come to holy touch. It was a wonderful power that the Lord Jesus had in his touch. He could put forth his hand and he could touch and he had that secret that we were hearing about. The secret of being able to transmit or channel the very power of God himself into men and women. He had power in his touch and he longs to teach us, every one of us, the same secret. Indeed, he longs to touch others through us. I would like to think first of all this evening of the inner touch before coming on to the outer touch. How we can touch men and women and other inner selves. The great secret, of course, is by prayer. Oh, it's a wonderful power that Jesus taught his disciples when he taught them how to pray. Some of us in our corporate silence prayer groups have also been realizing this tremendous truth. And I was so ignorant of it for many years of my life that our inner selves are as much in communication as our outer selves are that in the inner world made up of all our thoughts and the thoughts of everybody else, we human spirits can touch each other for good or for evil. We can bless and heal and help to heal each other or we can grievously wound and harm each other. In that inner world our inner selves are in communication and Jesus I believe did all his mighty works first of all in the inner world of spirit. Over and over again in the Gospels we read that Jesus went apart and spent all night by himself on some mountain. And I am convinced that in spirit he went to every village that he planned to go to in his outer body. And he touched in ourselves and prepared them for his coming. That is the lovely secret of prayer. You know that wonderful verse in the Bible? We may come boldly 
to the throne of grace. And the throne of grace is, of course, our Lord of all grace, the Lord of all grace and power himself. And when he tells us what his desires are concerning our loved ones, our friends, and those we are asked to remember in our prayers, then he allows us to carry his grace and his power and his blessing to those people. I am quite sure of one law of the inner spiritual world, and that is that loving desire in our hearts actually puts us in contact with the inner self of those we are longing to help. I won't ever forget the way in which I first made this tremendous discovery. I had prayed for a long time for certain friends of mine who'd been going through very great trials in their Christian life, but I hadn't been able to help them. I had prayed and had tried to speak to them helpfully and to show them how they should act under the certain circumstances they were in. It had all been a dreadful failure. These friends I had known for quite some time, and they were earnest Christians, but you know, earnest Christian families can have real troubles amongst themselves. And it so happened in that particular family, the only son of the family had married a girl that the father-in-law did not like. And it had made a very sad breach. The daughter-in-law naturally felt the father-in-law was not in sympathy and she was drawing away her husband. And there was this sad family breach and it grew and it grew even though they were all of them earnest Christians. It got so strong, this feeling in the family, that there was a real, a real and great breach and the son and his wife had gone away. The father-in-law felt that the daughter-in-law had stolen his only son away. And while this was going on, and they couldn't forgive each other, and they couldn't seem to make it up, the father-in-law quite suddenly died. And you know, when his will was read, it was found that he had left nearly all his money, had not left it to his only son, but had left it to other good causes. And you know, that breach was widened. Just seemed as though the son and the daughter-in-law could only feel the bitterness and the resentment that a Christian man should treat his own son in that way. And I had heard about this, and I had known them for a long time, and really my heart ached for them. And when at last I found myself in the town that they had made their home in, I wanted to go and see that man and his wife. And I turned up at their house, and they invited me in. But the moment I tried to speak to them about this breach that had never been healed before the father-in-law had died, oh, I couldn't say a word. There wasn't an opportunity to say anything at all. The mere mention of his name brought up all the inner bitterness that a Christian should have acted in that way. And I sat there really grieving and feeling so powerless, sat there for a whole evening. And still we were on this subject, and they could not get the bitterness out of their hearts. And when I went back to my hotel, 
I was really terribly sad about it, and I said to the Lord, I failed you, Lord. I didn't manage to say anything at all to that couple that could help them. And he said to me, never mind, Hannah, this is when I teach you the better way. Now listen, you may touch their inner selves. Sit here and talk with me and let me put my thoughts concerning this whole matter in your mind and in your loving desire, by means of your loving desire, I'm going to transmit those thoughts. From my heart, I'm going to transmit them through you to that couple. Well, I was quite aghast. I hadn't ever thought of such a thing before. I wondered if it could possibly work, but I thought at least I'll hear my Lord's thoughts concerning this sad thing. And I opened my mind, and he began speaking to me in my thoughts, and this is what he said. You know, Hannah, that father-in-law had loved me. He was a true Christian. And when he passed out of his body and passed on into the other world and into my presence, you know, Hannah, he began to see and understand things he'd never understood on earth. I was able to show him the better way of forgiveness and love. And you know, Hannah, he's been longing just longing for an opportunity to ask their pardon and to offer them his own forgiveness for the many times in which they hurt him. He's just longing for that. You tell them that in your prayer now. Transmit the thought that when we pass on into the other life, we see and understand things we didn't understand here. So I sat there for some time, an hour or more, I think, with my Lord, thinking his thoughts after him and asking that he would transmit them. And he said that my longing desire for them was putting me in touch with them. Well, the next morning I had to leave that town. I went away for three or four weeks. And then before going on elsewhere, I had to spend one night again in that same place. And I thought, I'll just go around and see that couple again. And when I rang the bell, they welcomed me in, and there was such a change, I could hardly think what had happened. They welcomed me in, and they put me in the guest chair, and they themselves opened up the conversation about their father-in-law. And you know, I found myself saying with my lips every one of those thoughts that I had thought in my heart three or four weeks earlier. And they sat perfectly quiet, and I said, you know, I'm absolutely certain that your father, your father-in-law, is just longing for you to know that he forgives you all the times that you hurt him, but I am quite, quite sure he'd love you to forgive him, and he would ask your pardon. And you know, the strangest look came over the face of the daughter-in-law, and she turned to me and she said, Heather, I believe you must be right. It's most strange. I've been dreaming about my father-in-law recently. And only a few nights ago, I had a very, very vivid dream. I seemed to be standing at the foot of a terribly high and steep stairway, and I had to go struggling up those stairs, and I felt I couldn't. And then I discovered my father-in-law was standing by me, and wanting to help me up. You see, it hadn't come to her with the words that had been in my mind. It had come to her in a dream. 
that he longed to help and forgive and that he would do all in his power to help. It's a wonderful thing, there's some of you who've been praying for your loved ones and you just don't have the opportunity of speaking to them. It's a wonderful thing that in spirit loving desire does really put us in touch. We can touch them and Jesus can transmit through the touch of our spirits his grace and his help and his power. Uh, some very, very interesting things happen when you're experimenting with corporate silence. Things that convince me over and over again that in the most extraordinary way our inner selves are in touch. I was very, very struck by one experience at a certain camp I was at before the end of the week of camp everybody who'd heard about a corporate silence group was very anxious to have a chance of sharing in it and in the end on the last afternoon I think three groups combined and we were a huge group nearly 100 and you know we had our 20 minutes of silence there and at the end of the silence, almost as soon as I said, has anybody, got, has anybody got anything that came through from the Lord that they feel that they should share? I've got somebody in the second or the third row of that big group of a hundred people. She was wearing a pale yellow dress. And she said, Hannah, I've never practiced corporate silence before, but do you know, the only thing that I could see the whole time was two babies. Well, I, I was saying to the Lord, now I wonder what that means, Lord, two babies. And the man in the front row held up his hand and said in a very curt tone of voice, I've never practiced corporate silence either and I don't understand this at all but the first thing that I saw was two babies. Well, you know, I was flummoxed. I said, did you get any idea, sir, as to what was the, these two babies were connected with? No, he said, I'm a doctor. I see lots of babies. I don't know what, what it had to do with. Well, then somebody else got up and said, I didn't see two babies, I saw ever so many babies. And all over that group of a hundred people, to my almost consternation, people got up and the only thing we could talk about was babies. <laughs> I couldn't get any ideas. At last I said rather helplessly, are oh, there any of you in this group expecting to be grandparents soon? <laughs> well, there were just a few, and then one young man got up and said rather bashfully, as a matter of fact, I'm expecting to be a father soon, but we're not really expecting two babies. Well, I was getting in great confusion. I couldn't think why a prayer group where we'd all gone so earnestly into the silence, seeking to learn from our Lord, we could think of nothing but babies. Then somebody said she thought it was to do with all the starving babies in China and India. And somebody else confirmed that by saying she just heard from somebody in Indochina telling of the terrible suffering and especially among the babies and the small children. And so this subject went round for the whole 15 or 20 minutes that we had. One or two rather unfortunate people got up and tried to share some other subject, but nobody was interested. It would only go back again to babies. But you know, the extraordinary thing was this. The day before that, I had had a conversation with someone who worked in the, in the, 
these courts amongst alcoholic girls and fallen women. And she had with her a helper and friend who was wearing a pale yellow dress. And they had asked me to join them in praying that the vision and concern on their heart for these alcoholic girls who were constantly appearing back in the court never really permanently helped that they might have a home for such people and such girls. And we had prayed for it. And the moment that girl in the third row in the pale yellow dress stood up and said, I saw two babies, I had actually opened my mouth and said, Well, my dear, considering what you were talking about yesterday morning, and then I broke off because I suddenly remembered that she and her friend had left directly after lunch that day and I realized this was not this was not the same person I had had the conversation with so I had broken off but at the end of the prayer group just as the supper bell rang and we'd all decided that the Lord had put upon our hearts a burden of compassion for starving babies around the whole world, all of a sudden I found myself turning to that woman in the third row, and I said, I feel I must just tell you. When you first stood up, I thought that you had spoken to me already about those girls who are constantly going back again into court can't be freed from their alcoholic craving and fallen mothers. And I was going to say to you that your vision of the two babies was God's seal that you were to do something for the babies of unmarried mothers. And I looked out over that big prayer group and I said, I believe there's someone here whom God wants to have a concern to help the babies of unmarried mothers. With that, we closed that extraordinary prayer group. I said to them, I must confess, I have never been in such an extraordinary prayer group. Don't know what happened. And as we were all going out of that room and going along to the dining room for the evening meal, an arm slipped into mine and it had a pale yellow sleeve. And I looked up and there was that woman and she said, Hannah, it's very queer I wore my pale yellow dress to the prayer group. I would planned to put on something else and then I changed my mind. And I said to her, well, my dear, I think you must have been guided because I feel pretty sure there was somebody in that group the Lord wanted to burden with a concern for the babies of unmarried mothers. And she didn't say a word. She slipped away. And I sat down at the table in the dining room, and you know the uproar with all those people. It was a big camp. I couldn't hear myself think even. Certainly the neighbor on this side and the neighbor on that side couldn't hear anything. And all of a sudden, an arm in a pale yellow sleeve was slipped over my shoulder. And a voice said right in my ear, Hannah, I must come and tell you. My Lord told me I must come and tell you. She said, Hannah, years ago I was an unmarried mother. She said, now I have a lovely husband and a beautiful home and two sons. They are not babies now, they are grown up. I had to tell you. And I looked up at her and I said, oh my dear, you know your Lord was telling you as plainly as anything, it isn't right 
that you should have a lovely husband and a beautiful, happy home and two sons and not do anything for other babies of unmarried women. And she simply whispered in my ear, I know you're right. Isn't that extraordinary? But you know the most extraordinary point when I thought it over afterwards? I am absolutely certain the two I had spoken to about a home for alcoholic women had never mentioned unmarried mothers or babies. All they planned to do was open a home for girls to come and get rid of the craving for alcoholics. It's a very, very wonderful and extraordinary thing how God can speak to us, to our inner selves, and make us, almost without understanding, able to transmit his messages. Maybe there are some of you here and you also have loved ones who need beyond everything else the power, the liberating, cleansing, saving power of the Lord Jesus flowing into them. He can touch them, their inner selves, through you. And all that he wants to tell them and all that he wants to do in touching them, he can do through you by this wonderful power of prayer. But you know, Jesus also had a wonderful physical touch. Whenever he was moved with a certain emotion, he always put forth his hand and he touched the person. It was when he was moved with compassion. Oh, we've been thinking a lot about criticism here, haven't we, at this camp. And many of us have been so convicted and so conscious that our criticism has been such a hindering thing. Criticism is so powerless. I am absolutely convinced that there's only one channel which will transmit healing, and that is the channel of uttermost compassion. And we can block that channel by substituting that dreadful thing, criticism. When we discern the need of somebody, that discernment can either turn into criticism, which won't do any good, which will, but which will only harm, or it can turn into camp compassion, and by that means it will be able to transmit. Jesus, I verily believe, is longing to, to teach us how he can transmit through our physical touch. I may tell you I've had a terrible time coming to this conclusion. I am English, and when I came to CFO camps, I thought I'd come into an atmosphere of such marvelous love as I had never felt before. And I thanked God for it. With my whole heart, I was grateful for that love. But my goodness, I thought there was so much hugging and kissing at CFO camps that I just didn't know where to put myself. It seemed to me that everybody's arms were slipping around one, and I'm English and I wasn't accustomed to it, and I found it the most extraordinary experience. 
Somebody tell me yesterday how much J.B. Phillips had helped them. You know, J.B. Phillips translated the epistles of Paul into everyday English. And anybody reading J.B. Phillips's translation of the epistles of St. Paul can't help realizing very quickly he's English. He isn't American and he isn't CFO. Not yet. And anybody reading J.B. Phillips's translation of the epistles of St. Paul can't help realizing very quickly he's English. He isn't American and he isn't CFO. Not yet. Because Sir J.B. Phillips translates that saying of Paul when he said, and greet one another with a holy kiss. J.B. Phillips says in the proper British way, and shake hands together all round. <laughs> That was my feeling exactly. I got to talking to the Lord about this. I said, you know, Lord, I love CFO. I'm terribly grateful to you for bringing me into it. But Lord, they do too much touching, too much hugging all together, especially in hot weather, Lord. <laughs> Well, you know, I went on to several camps and at last I came to one particular camp which seemed to me to be the most, the most lovingest and the most touchingest camp I had ever been in. And I felt really I couldn't bear it any longer. And one day I went away in my room with the Lord and I said, Lord, you must help me over this. <laughs> and I flapped open my Bible, and do you know it opened, I think it was the 20th chapter of John, on the resurrection morning, Mary catching sight of the risen Lord and rushing forward to touch him, and he said, touch me not. <laughs> And I thought to myself, hooray, I knew I was right. I knew I was right, Lord. And then he said to me, Hannah, just look through the Gospels and see how often I say, touch me not. And I began, it was a real Bible study, went through the four Gospels, nearly every page I saw Jesus put forth his hand and touch. Jesus put forth his hand and took hold of somebody. But I never found a single place where he said, touch me not, except in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel on the Resurrection Day. And in rather a trembling tone of voice in my thoughts, I said to him, well, Lord, doesn't that mean that since the resurrection, we don't need all this hugging and kissing? <laughs> And then he showed me something I had never been able to see before. He showed me that Mary, one of my fellow women who loved the Lord so much, Mary was privileged to teach his brethren this wonderful new thing that they were to learn. On the resurrection day, Jesus taught Mary this. Look, Mary, I'm going from you in person. You're not going to be able to touch me, the man Jesus, very much longer. I want you to understand now. Whenever you want to touch me in the future, you can only touch me in another human being. 
Whenever you want to love me in the future, Mary, you can only love me in others. That was a big day for Hannah, you know. I had to change right over in my ideas on that day. But I learned then this lovely, wonderful fact that there is power in the touch. And the touch can transmit the love and the healing and the compassion of Jesus Christ. But I did learn something else. I think I saw that it must be holy touch and reverent touch, that we should never touch lightly or carelessly or thoughtlessly or boisterously, but always with this wonderful feeling that we are touching and loving him in that person. It's the only way that we can touch him and it's the only way that we can express our love. You know, we were speaking about Clem's lips the other day and how we can break the power of creative speech by speaking carelessly in the wrong way. I verily believe we can dissipate the power of holy touch by touching carelessly or thoughtlessly. It should always be the touch of true love and discerning the body of our dear Lord Jesus Christ. And if that other human body is wounded or sick or suffering, then we touch them as we would touch him, wounded and sick and suffering. And if that other one is lonely and feeling that nobody in the world loves them, then we touch them as knowing that he feels it with them. And anyone fearful or frightened, why, even Hannah knows that when she's terrified, the grasp of a strong, understanding, friendly hand means everything in comfort and power. Oh, yes, I know that too. So it is we may touch for him, and it's a wonderful privilege. But you know, there was something else about our Lord Jesus. Not only when he put forth his hand and touched people could they receive his power, but you know if they put forth their hand and touched him, his power could flow into them. That's a wonderful thing. I will never forget how I felt just at that time when I was going through that struggle about touch me not, one day at a camp, somebody came up to me and put her arm through mine, and I suppose I was very hot and tired, and she must have felt that I rather shrank away. And she looked at me and she said almost pitifully, Hannah, I'm sorry. But you know, I came to this camp with such a great need, almost in despair, and I thought, Hannah, if I could touch you, I could touch Christ in you. Is that possible? Yes. Do you know it is possible they can touch Christ in us? If the circuit is complete and if there is no self-consciousness in us, only Christ consciousness, that's a most wonderful thing, that he should make us power stations so that people can put out their hands 
and literally in their need and in their longing or their fear or their loneliness can literally touch Christ in us, but not. They can't do it when we are full of self-consciousness. You know that wonderful little book called Christ in You? On almost the first page of that little book, there is something tremendous written. The only Satan that you and I are up against, the only adversary making the presence of God unreal to us, making Christ consciousness impossible to us, the only Satan is self-consciousness. I believe it. And there's a lovely verse in the Bible that says, and God shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. It's a wonderful thing to learn the secret of ceasing to be self-conscious and becoming gloriously Christ consciousness. And yet, you know, for a long time I didn't understand how it could happen. I was all confused about self-consciousness. I didn't see how I could stop being conscious. But you know, there's a great difference between being conscious and being self-conscious. You know, I can't help being conscious now as I stand up here. I'm on a rather high platform and I've got some funny little gadgets in front of me and I'm up above you and you're all sitting down there and I can see the tops of your heads as well as your faces. I'm conscious of these things through my physical senses. I can't stop being conscious that I'm rather hot. That isn't self-consciousness. What would be self-consciousness would be if I began thinking to myself, there they are, I wonder what they're thinking about me. Are they thinking there's Hannah looking untidy as usual? Is she going to be able to say anything to us? If I began picturing myself up here and your thoughts about me, if I even began thinking to myself, I wonder if the Lord can speak through me this evening. That would be self-consciousness. I learned a lovely secret years ago. I used to be terribly self-conscious on the platform. Used to shake with nervousness and suffer absolute agonies of fright every time I had to stand up in public just because I was so self-conscious I pictured myself up there and I pictured what people were thinking about me and the Lord freed me from that by telling me this lovely secret he said Hannah you need never picture any meeting at all you need never even picture who are going to be there. Never think about any meeting you're going to speak at. Only make sure you've got my message. And when you come off the platform, you need never recall the memory of that meeting into your mind at all. And it'll keep you free from being self-conscious. It does work. It works beautifully. You know what I do when I'm beginning to feel a little apprehensive or I'm rather extra hot or tired and know I've got to go up on the platform? I picture Jesus getting up on the platform. I picture Jesus standing up there and speaking and saying just the things that are going to help those who hear. And then you don't have to picture yourself at all. It's a wonderful thing, and it's a wonderful surprise what a job many of us have in getting free from self-consciousness. I was telling them at the Ohio camp of an experience I had recently over in New Zealand. I'd been asked to speak at the Rotary Club. And in honor of the gentleman of the Rotary Club, I wore a hat. You've never seen Hannah in a hat, I'm pretty sure. 
but I had one very small, very elegant um, American hat. And in honor of the Rotary Club, I put it on my head and it was very small and I had made the fatal mistake of shampooing my hair the day before. <laughs> and it was quite obvious to me as soon as I got up on my feet and began to address these gentlemen that that hat was not going to stay on my head. I kept putting my hands up and shooing it up the back, but of course it was quite obviously not going to remain there. You know, if I'd been over in this country, some friendly voice would have called out instantly, Hi, Hannah, take it off and make yourself comfortable. <laughs> but I was taught 